In this lecture, Dr. Robert Howard and Dr. Alison Bronowski provide insightful comments in response to a BBC clip on Yemen post-Arab Spring. The original BBC clip can be found on the Glover Cottages portal. It's a very disturbing uh, piece of footage and uh, I suppose all of us share the view of many people when they see something like that they recoil and say, well, this is appalling, something should be done, um, and what can be done? Now, I think in a group like this, we ought to try and um, see this as a problem in international relations. Uh, it's a human rights problem. We've talked uh, a bit in the last few weeks about human rights. And uh, most of that gets uh, discussed in the context of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, ethnic cleansing and things of that nature. But clearly, the right to subsistence, and in particular to adequate food, certainly is, in the view of many people, a fundamental human right. I'm reminded of uh, the opinions of John Vincent, um, one of the leading authorities on the issue of human rights in international relations. He, like many people who applied themselves to this question, was troubled by the fact that it was difficult to get a consensus across a multiplicity of cultures about uh, what constituted a human right. And he thought that something basic and fundamental was the way to do this. And he hit on the idea of subsistence and, in particular, access to adequate food. Now, he wrote about this way back in the 1970s, but it tends to get left out of account. Although I'm reminded of uh, the thing in an article that some of you may be interested in, which is in the latest issue of the Australian Journal of International Relations, which is a publication of the Institute. It's by Sarah Davies and it's called Duty in a Time of Epidemics. She's not talking about what we saw, but she's talking about another human rights problem. She's drawing attention to the fact that um, what happens when epidemics break out in a country and the government either won't or is unwilling to do anything about it. Does this constitute a problem in international relations and does the rest of the international community have an obligation to do something about it? Now, it's in this context that uh, I think we should try and view this. What was, is depicted constitutes a massive um, human rights problem. And one way to look at it is to look at it in the constant context of the responsibilities of governments to do something about it. We talked about this in the con context of a responsibility to protect, but um, the responsibility to protect doctrine only really refers to things like genocide, or not only, but to things like genocide, ethnic cleansing, uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity. But clearly, we could argue that countries and governments have a, res a responsibility to provide their citizens with subsistence. Surely this is a basic human right that would be immediately recognisable uh, across, uh, across cultures. Mm. But of course, the problems in dealing with this in the context of a responsibility to protect are very real, and they are distressingly so, even in a situation like this. And that is the problem of interests and um, powers and movements around the world have interests. Uh, you couldn't help but notice that towards the end of that, there was the reference to the fight against Al-Qaeda and to the fact that the United States has a very real interest in supporting um, uh, the newly uh, installed government in Yemen. There was an overthrow of the other government um, earlier in the year, and the new government is one that's committed to uh, fighting Al-Qaeda. But at least you do have two outs interests I wouldn't say they're necessary outside. The American interest is obviously from outside. You have two interests who seemingly are prepared to pursue their interests regardless of, um, of what is happening. And uh, this is a major problem. 
getting around the difficulties of sovereignty and, uh, and great power uh, intervention. Um, they are problems whenever we approach the issue of human rights uh, from a global perspective uh, in international relations. So I'd like to kick off the discussion by reminding everybody that there is a fundamental problem here of how you prosecute human rights globally. And in a situation like the one we just seen on the film clip, we are addressing a fundamental uh, human right. What do we do about it? I think uh, in order to do something about it, we ought to understand some of the difficulties uh, in the path of doing something about it. And uh, I must say, I was fascinated by Colin's challenge to rise to this occasion this evening. Uh, because really, if you mention Yemen to me, the first thing that comes to my mind is that British movie about um, fly fishing in the salmon fishing in the Yemen, which was, I, I, I think, probably the first images of Yemen that I had ever seen, and maybe it's the same for those of you who saw it. But the interesting thing about that film was that it did describe, I mean, it did give you a hint at the kind of harshness of the country, the kinds of um, social situations, tribal uh, situations that it um, comes from, it lives with, and, and are the nature of it and have been for millennia um, and which are clearly not going to change in spite of the fact that after that movie was a terrific success they were deluged with tourists wanting to go and catch salmon <laughs> in the rivers so-called rivers of Yemen most of which were, were dry as you saw in the movie so here we have here we have a situation where we on the outside, know nothing, feel powerless, see a BBC docker like this, and then ask ourselves, as Robert has suggested, what we are then to make of it. Now the, the knee-jerk response is, we've got to go and help those people, or somebody has to go and help those people. Isn't it? I mean, it's how you feel. There are, I am sorry to say, if you look at the Millennium Development Goals, underperforming countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, across the board, not only Yemen, but the others as well. By 2015, most of those will not have achieved any of the goals for um, uh, overcoming infant mortality maternal mortality and childbirth, malnutrition, etc., etc., clean water supply, and so on. And then you have to say to yourself, well, why is this so? Because the rich world has made contributions, or promised contributions at least, to the Millennium Development Goals, which, most of which, have come pretty close to the target. Why isn't it working? Why is it just the same? Actually, the doctor there said he hadn't seen anything as bad as this. So maybe it's not just the same. Maybe it's worse now because of the drought and the war and so on and so on. Maybe he's right. But nothing has changed. And my own quite radical view on this is that A, although we all have this instinct to deliver it, isn't the answer. Isn't the answer at all. Because if you go in there with truckloads of stuff to make sure that children have some kind of Western-produced formula that gets fed to them. That is going to be a problem itself. Let's not even go there. But look at that population. Look at what you saw in that BBC program. There were a whole lot of very thin children, very thin mothers, and very thin grandmothers. And then some rather fat-looking men sitting around or marching up and down in American uniforms. I mean, clearly what is happening in Yemen 
is the same as what's happening in a lot of similar places and studies, that there is a great shortage, not of food, but of people with the money to buy food. And the people who haven't got the money to buy the food are the women and children. And you saw in those little clips that he put up there, the people who were tilling the fields were women in veils. You didn't see a man, there may be, but he didn't show them. No men tilling the fields. They're sitting around taking cap. And cap, the last time I looked at it, I may be wrong, he didn't say this, but certainly under the previous regime, cap was what the ruler gave to people to keep them quiet. This is the summer, you know, this is, this is Orwellian stuff. This is what you take when you can't bear it anymore, or when you're simply too bored sitting around with your mates to go out and work in the field. Because the women are working in the field with their burkas on. So aid doesn't cut it. Ever. Terrible. Sorry. Aid doesn't um, resolve the problem, I would suggest, in a place like this. And then you will immediately say, as you're quite right to say, well then what does, and I don't know. But certainly more military, you know, more guns coming in on whichever side. Oh, we oppose Al Qaeda, so now we're going to get smart new American weapons and all that stuff. And we're going to enrich ourselves, so we're going to take lots of money. And we're going to get fat, and we're going to sit around and be bored while the women in the country and the children die. Um, aid is not the answer. Clearly, the problem is cultural. And the problem goes way, way back into tribal history because Yemen remains, for all sorts of reasons, a tribal country. And when there are tribes, very often tribes have good effects, but when a tribe gets modern weapons and tries to live in the modern world and tries to change its ways or doesn't try to change its ways, then you have all kinds of problems. So here we are in Australia not knowing what to do, and I haven't got an answer myself. But I do, I always listen with BBC because I want to know where the right and now, now here's the answer line comes. And he only once met, mentioned Oxfam. But I would bet that Oxfam, uh, well he said Oxfam is active there but haven't got enough resources. So the next thing will be we'll, we'll see a program for Yemen. Well good, great. Let's support Oxfam if we think that that kind of aid is going to be the right thing.